I think it's interesting that just so much of social permaculture is being driven by women. Not just social permaculture, when I look at uh, a lot of social movements, like uh, just in my village here, the sustainability initiatives here, women are the key drivers of almost everything. And, you know, building community is a really big part of it. So I think that's one of the areas of uh, social permaculture that I'm most passionate about is community building and creating resilient communities. And I was involved in the whole intentional community uh, movement for a long time uh, from 1978, uh, 79, I think, when... Um, the Lismore Council um, threatened to bulldoze uh, all the illegal dwellings on the illegal multiple occupancies and communities in the Lismore area. And, you know, there were these setting up up and down the coast. We had a cluster of them uh, around Warhope and, and we set up multiple occupancy associations and looking at, you know, the social issues, the economic issues, the governance issues, you know, land management and design. Um, the human dynamics and uh, human needs uh, that uh, was the area that I was most engaged in and uh, with also sort of recognizing that it's not just about intentional communities or gated communities uh, it's wider community you know we need to work on that wider community level it's not just about you know, these little enclaves uh, of like-minded people, we've really got to embrace that wider uh, community and uh, human diversity and learn to communicate with people that think differently uh, to ourselves and have different values to ourselves, find our common ground and, and build on that. Uh, so I've been really fascinated with, you know, the potential and involved in the potential of effective uh, community consultation processes and ways that we can bring people together and find a common ground that we can then build on and um, start to envisage where we want to go to and uh, what are the baby steps of things that are highly attainable that we can actually act on now because I think so often with visioning the visions are so big that people then feel overwhelmed and oh how do we ever get there you know so breaking things down to actually you know bite-sized chunks and uh doable steps so what can we actually do now with with without you know big injections of money or resources you know what have we actually got the resources to do right here and now and start to make small improvements and then you know the momentum can build from there and and uh, if we've got the big vision, I mean, I'm not saying don't have a big vision. We need the big vision because then opportunities arise. And if we've got the big vision and suddenly a big opportunity comes up with the, hey, we can harness that to do this and, you know, sort of really gallop ahead on that particular front. Social permaculture can get a little bit off with the, off with the fairies mm -hmm. and it can get stuck in, I think, um, unrealistic optimism. And I mean, yeah, we've got to work on ourselves. It's really important that sort of that zone zero, but I think some of the ways that we can actually work on ourselves is also through working on the outside world. We can learn so much from nature uh, on a spiritual level, on an intellectual level, on a practical level. You know, when we look at, you know, a forest ecosystem, when we look at a tree, I mean, nature is just naturally generous you know it's not conditional we've got a lot to learn from that and i think we've become uh, a very very much sort of self-focused society and people that are just afraid to reach out afraid of difference afraid of being generous i think um rampant capitalism has been a big part of that and, and this absolute fear of anything sort of socialist or equal or, you know, sort of sharing, sharing surpluses and abundances. The, the system tends to function on fear, uh, fear of going without, and it's also um, appealing to people's greed. We need to find ways to move beyond that so that we can, you know, be motivated from a perspective of love 
of, uh, of giving, of forgiveness, of embracing difference, of uh, graciousness. Um, I'm fearful of uh, climate change and, you know, what's happening to our beautiful palette, but it's not fear that motivates me. It's the, the, the love of life. It's the love of the species and trying to save what we can of planet Earth and the love of humanity. And uh, how can we come together and express this in a meaningful and creative way and have um, meaningful or productive um, convivial relationships like um, it's beautiful here in our community. We've, you know, we've done a lot of work in terms of um, coming together and buying community assets, uh, mm -hmm. which is um, quite an unusual thing. Most communities are sort of, and look, Nimbin did too, uh, up until uh, the um, early 90s, and uh, always complaining about a lack of government funding for uh, services and things. And then the um, new school was built and the old school went on the market. And uh, the Department of Education uh, said, if, you know, look, if it goes to public ownership, it'll be half the price. So we had a series of community meetings saying, wouldn't it be great if we could buy the old school? Because we desperately need housing for, you know, all our community organizations and initiatives. Some of them were sort of stacking, you know, sort of three or four organizations on top of each other with their, filing cabinets in a little tiny space that was like two by six meters and things like that in town. And, and so um, we approached council and they said, well, look, you know, the community can raise half the money and uh, develop a watertight uh, business plan to pay off the rest. We'll, you know, look at a low to no interest loan. And uh, so in 18 months, the community raised $118,000. And Fantastic. it's not a community with much disposable income. It really meant building a lot of bridges. Yeah. You know, it was very much a divided community before, but we had to really come together to achieve this aim. And it was so empowering. And right on the tail of uh, achieving this, uh, we had a visit from Robert Theobald, the futurist, the Canadian futurist. And his message was just pure bioregionalism. I mean, it's basically what I teach in the bioregional session um, of the PDC. But, it, you know, sometimes it takes somebody from the outside coming in, talking to a community. And, uh, and that just was the right time and the right message. And it just resonated with everybody. So then we set up a community forum that met once a month. Nobody controlled it. No one organisation controlled it. It was... Um, one, one community group would make sure the venue was um, booked and another community group took after and look after, looked after another aspect but the agenda was set by the wider community at these forums and uh, we, uh, and there were solutions focused. They weren't just, um, as, you know, a, a, a soapbox for people to, you know, um, just indulge in complaining and uh, we solved a lot of community issues and social issues and um, we uh, even council used to come and uh, get input from uh, these forums in terms of uh, decisions that they were making that impacted on Nimbin and developing new development control plans for the village and uh, things like that. Um, and I'm, you know, after uh, six, seven, eight years, we sort of started to run out of issues, <laughs> which was really good. And so then we said, well, look, okay, we won't have monthly forums just as required. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to uh, 2008, uh, we had um, another big sort of community meeting uh, in the hall and uh, I facilitated some of the transition town uh, processes and, uh, and it was, came under the banner of Sustainable Nimbin. And um, out of that, we uh, created a number of working groups. Um, the three big priorities were food security, um, renewable energy, 
and um, and transport. Transport's a really tricky one now, uh, especially in rural Australia where there's or, you know, little to no uh, public transport and people are really motor vehicle dependent. And I think that's sort of one of the Achilles heels that you know we've got to uh, find some creative solutions for. But uh, that's sort of that's another whole conversation there. Um, I've got lots of ideas. Uh, so um, where were we? Yeah. So with the like on the food security front, uh, we've got two local farmers markets going. We um, had uh, Rabina McCurdy. Uh, she was in Australia from New Zealand, and so uh, we invited her to conduct a series of uh, workshops, and one was with um, landholders and farmers and producers, and seeing, you know, who was producing what, who had the potential to produce, what were the impediments to producing uh, more of our, our food needs locally. And uh, then we had one with um, the retail sector, so shops, cafes, and, and, and so forth, and one with the two groups together uh, so that we could start to build, you know, links and, and, and stuff. And look, wow, what's come out of that? I mean, um, prior to the food security group, um, we probably, I know I might have managed if I was lucky to sort of like maybe 40, 50% of my diet would come from, you know, the garden and the local area. Now it's sort of around 80, 90% within a 30 kilometer radius of Nimbin. Um, and, you know, that feels so good. And uh, it's been, I mean, these seem like sort of like practical outside things, but they also have a direct impact on people. They're also social systems. They're not just food systems, they are social systems. And they're ones that are meeting real human needs. I mean, we need farmers, we need food three times a day at least. And um, there's nothing more personal than what we put in our mouth to become us, you know? We are what we eat. And, um, but so over the years, doing these uh, projects together, um, as a community, it, it starts to build up a degree of community trust. And we had a devastating um, event happen, I think that was around 2010, 11, around then, um, where the Rainbow Cafe and the Nimbin Museum and a couple of shops uh, burnt down in the middle of the village. And uh, it just, it, well, you know, that, that, that was the heart of the village. And um, you know, the, those buildings just had such a history. Those businesses had such a history um, that, you know, it was a big part of the community and a uh, sense of place and identity. And uh, it was uh, pretty, pretty devastating. And then hot on the heels of that, our uh, local organic shop, which had been functioning for sort of like, you know, sort of oh, nearly 20 years, uh, said that they were closing their doors at the end of the week. And, um, and uh, so uh, we organized a meeting in the hall uh, within 24 hours, uh, 80 people turned up, uh, including the owners of the, uh, of the, of the, of the shop. And um, we decided unanimously to take over the organic shop as a food co-op. The owners said they would support that community process we had a legal entity in place, you know, for managing the community uh, for the farmers markets and, and stuff. So that became umbrella organization to take on the leasing accounts until we could actually incorporate our, um, our cooperative. And uh, so we had a meeting on Monday night, the uh, shop uh, closed down on Friday night and on Monday, Following Monday morning, it opened up as Nimbin Food Co-op. So, um, and that was just, everybody was buzzing on that. But you see that, I think like 10 years earlier, it wouldn't have happened like that. Uh, it's just that through people working together and actually making things happen as a community, it builds a degree of trust. 
And to me, being able to just go, yes, we're going to form a food co-op and people said, I can do this, I can do that, I know about this. Um, and that it could just happen so quickly. Mm. To me was the mark of, uh, I suppose, a degree of maturity uh, in terms of community trust and functionality. And um, um, we've seen it with, you know, how the community responds to disasters when we had the fires here, when we get cut off by floods or even with the lockdown with the pandemic last year and uh, just how people really look after each other. And there's all these different community groups that just automatically assume different roles that are complementary, you know, and they're not treading on each other's toes. And uh, so that, you know, basically, you know, all bases are, 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 are covered and um, it's a community that looks after its vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really important. You know, it's really easy for highly educated middle-class people to, you know, sort of create their own little scene. Uh, but what about, you know, the vulnerable in our society? What about, you know, the disenfranchised, the unemployed, the people that have got problems of addiction and which is only because they've got other unresolved, you know, social issues and economic issues in their lives. And, um, and so, you know, a community that's sort of got that degree of compassion across the board I think it's gold and that's um I, I just love to share the story of what we're doing here because people find it really empowering and um and you know as communities you know we can really start to do a lot a lot more than we can just as individuals but you know we need to be able to facilitate we need to we need good methods of governance and uh, we need to build uh you know, trust structures through um, actually a achieving and meeting needs and showing compassion and being empathetic, but also, you know, being real. Mm? Yeah, thank you.